Hi, I'm Mark Thomas, Senior Lecturer at London South Bank University and a member of the CPEL development team, the Royal College of Chiropractors. This research project is discussing 10 years of online incident reporting and learning using CPELs, the Chiropractic Patient Incident Reporting and Learning System. As we're aware, there's a focus on patient safety and that's paramount within global healthcare. Part of that includes reporting incidents and near misses and also learning from those incidents. In the chiropractic profession in Europe, we have CPELs to be able to do this. And it was developed and launched in 2009, currently accessible to all chiropractors in the UK and members of the ECU. CPELs is accessible via CPELs.org, which is a secure, anonymous online incident reporting and learning platform and enables chiropractors to share and comment on safety incidents. The objectives of this study were threefold. One, to review the use of the database by the profession over the last 10 years, to report on frequency of incident categories and patient harm, and to analyse the database to identify any key areas for patient safety improvement. Part one is a retrospective analysis of the database of frequency statistics, looking at reporting trends, including frequency of incident categories, as well as level of harm. And part two is a thematic analysis used to identify themes relating to any contributory factors and subsequent learning. The data set itself, as I mentioned, was over a 10-year period, April 2009 to March 2019, and in total that included 268 separate incidents. The trend line over the last 10 years suggests there is an increase in the amount of reporting. However, overall, reporting appears to be at an extremely low rate, which is expected based on the literature around barriers to incident reporting. Common subcategories within the system included incidents over 5% of the total database, included trips and falls, which is not expected. This has been highlighted previously and is a well-known risk within healthcare settings. Adverse events were also included and they were described and split into patient experiencing post-treatment distress or pain. This was by far the largest subcategory with 28.4% of all incidents. Patient experienced negative effects during treatment. An example given in this case would be a fractured rib or clavicle. This accounted for 8.2% of incidents on the database and more significant or serious adverse events described as patient experience significant post-treatment effects. The example on the system given is neurological problem or disc prolapse, accounting for 5.2%. There's also um, a large subcategory of unspecified incidents, 5.2%. Um, unfortunately, they were incorrectly or not categorised. We also managed to identify two new subcategories with over 5% of incidents. These included fainting, 5.6%, and missing an underlying pathology, 8.2%. In relation to fainting, it was clear from looking through the database that this was a, a theme and a keyword search identified 15 incidents. Most occurred during the examination phase, two of which during blood pressure testing. The majority involved patients in the 25 to 34 year old age group. Patient experiencing post-treatment distress or pain. As mentioned, this was the largest subcategory and this data could be categorized further in some cases, including acupuncture incidents, nine incidents involving cervical spine, 21, and incidents involving pelvic girdle, 21. In relation to the cervical spine, 11 cases describe neurological symptoms, 10 describe pain. Spinal molecular therapy was used in majority of cases, 67%. Majority of patients were female. The patient's age range appeared evenly distributed. In relation to pelvic girdle post-treatment distress or pain, pain was the most common post-treatment reaction. In relation to being linked with a certain modality, the most common modality this was linked to a soft tissue therapy as opposed to direct therapy to the spine, manipulation or mobilization. And the most common um, type of incident recorded involved 
trigger point therapy to the gluteal region resulting in pain and localized bruising. The majority of patients were female and all patients were over the age of 45. Patients experiencing negative effects during treatment, remember the example given in this case was of a rib fracture or clavicle fracture, and in fact, 14 incidents suggested that a rib fracture was likely to have occurred. 10 out of 14 of these cases were female. In relation to age distribution, no patients were under the age of 44. The largest group was actually in middle-aged patients, so age 45 to 64, um, and several patients over 65. Now, this is uh, interesting to reflect on this data, um, and the question becomes, are we paying enough concern to younger patients, especially in relation to a known risk of fracture osteoporosis? One patient aged 45 to 54 had known osteoporosis. Another patient in the same age group was diagnosed with osteoporosis by the medical practitioner following the suspected rib fracture. A recent quality standard by the Royal College of Chiropractors now actually recommends a screening of all patients over 40 for, for potential osteoporosis or osteopenia. 13 of the 14 cases involved a prone of P to A thoracic or side posture manipulation technique. Other techniques of thoracic or lumbar regions, including manipulation delivered from an A to P or the patient in a supine position, were only associated with soft tissue or joint injury and not suspected rib fracture. Patients experienced significant post-treatment uh, effects that were Several extremely interesting cases within this group and pathologies range from cord equinus syndrome to stroke-like events. Uh, the new category of missing and underlying pathology, again, had a, a number of extremely interesting uh, cases to review, including examples of abdominal aortic aneurysm, spinal pathological fracture, normally resulting from uh, cancer, and what was interesting is there's some crossover between the last two subcategories and it's often decided by the clinician's perspective, i.e. did they feel the condition was a result of the intervention or due to the pre-existing pathology which determined how they interpreted and categorised the incident. But of course, when discussing serious adverse events following spinal motor therapy, cannot prove the event happened because of or in spite of treatment. However, it was clear that clinicians felt an absent delayed or inappropriate referral for specialist review or diagnostics played a role in this category. In relation to patient harm, 41% of red incidents occurred and they stated that patient harm was present. Of these, over 50% were described as avoidable and over 60% state that it's likely a clinician's actions or inactions were responsible for that incident. Now, I feel these numbers are significant and shows that there's potential to reduce patient harm through adapting or changing elements of our clinical practice. In relation to grading or severity of patient harm, the majority, as expected, were in the low grade of harm, over 50%, just over 10%, 11.1% were regarded as severe harm. Now it's worth mentioning at this stage, there's currently no available definition for the three categories of harm on the CPEL system, meaning there's no standard approach to the classification used by chiropractors when recording incidents. In terms of learning from incidents, it was a uh, Clear, unfortunately, the majority of cases, the emphasis was based on the reporting rather than learning from the event. And some aspect of learning from the incident was only documented in just over 50% of cases. In relation to interaction, 59 comments were present relating to 39 incidents. However, all of these comments occurred prior to October 2015. So limitations of this study analysing this database, number one is that we're not able to demonstrate any rate of occurrence. It's a passive surveillance system. There's no denominator, i.e. there's no data on the number of patient visits available. There's clearly low levels of 
reporting, so low quantity of data, and the accuracy of data recorded is very limited with significant errors and omissions, meaning there's a lack of quality of the data. Uh, as mentioned, we're only able to demonstrate associations rather than causation of harm. And again, as mentioned, severity of harm data is not valid as there's no standardization of criteria used. So in conclusion, there is an increase in incident reporting over the last 10 years. However, there still appears to be significant under-reporting by the profession. And shared learning is not present in almost 50% of cases. Two new incident subcategories have been identified, highlighting potential patient risk. Thank you.